Welcome to the program Boredom, Loneliness and Impatience presented by Radboud Reflect at the Go Short International Film Festival. Boredom, loneliness and impatience are all emotions that we might not like, but which are nonetheless part of our human uh, experience in this world. And all they, they uh, might appear very negative on the surface, they do reveal some important things to us about what it means to be human. And because of that, we have two philosophers from Radboud University here today who are going to reveal us more about these uh, things. Um, they will not uh, do so in and on itself, but we will watch three short movies, which of course have to do with boredom, loneliness and impatience. And I will tell more about them uh, once we will get there in the pro um, uh, later in the program. Um, the speakers are Eva McInerney and uh, Tim Michels. And if you uh, have any questions for them, we will address them after their lectures and after the um, uh, two short movies about uh, boredom and loneliness. Uh, if you want to ask him, you can go to menti.com and uh, fill in the code, which is now also appearing uh, in the screen below me, 72522630. Um, so this is a program uh, which is a collaboration between Radboud uh, Reflects from Radboud University and the Go Short uh, Film Festival, which is uh, this year uh, fully online and lasts until the 5th of April. So if you can go to the website, you can see a lot of interesting short movies um, that you can watch. Uh, so first, boredom. Uh, the first speaker is Tim Michels. He is a PhD uh, candidate at Radboud University, uh, specializing in continental philosophy and an editor at Philosophy magazine. And he is going to talk about uh, the work of German philosopher Martin Heidegger on boredom. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. Real philosophy does not start with curiosity or amazement. It starts with boredom, a deep existential boredom that confronts you with the utter meaninglessness and finitude of your existence. What exactly happens to us when we are bored? That was one of the questions German philosopher Martin Heidegger wanted to answer in his lecture course, The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics. His guiding idea was that deep existential boredom can be a fruitful starting point for philosophy. In order to explain this, he outlines three forms of boredom, starting with the most everyday superficial one and working towards the deepest existential one. For the first, most superficial form of boredom, Heidegger asks you to imagine arriving at a rural train station and realizing that your train is four hours late. There are no facilities nearby, you have finished the book in your backpack, and to update the example to more contemporary terms, your smartphone battery is dead. You cannot leave because you cannot miss this train, so the only thing left is to remain at this station and wait. What do you do? Most likely you will try to find some form of distraction, pace up and down the platform, count the trees lining the street opposite the station, study the train timetable that is posted at the platform entrance. In other words, you try to pass the time. When we are bored, time tends to drag and we will do anything in our power to try to make the time go by faster, anything not to succumb to this lurking feeling of boredom. In this case, the external circumstance of the delayed train is the cause of our boredom. And Heidegger calls this form of boredom being bored by something. For the second form of boredom, imagine going to a dinner party with some friends or coworkers. At this dinner party, the conversation is lively, the music is pleasant, and the food is delicious. And yet, when you look back at this evening, you cannot shake the sinking feeling that you were in fact bored the entire time. Only in this instance, your boredom was not caused by the dinner party itself, which was a perfectly pleasant affair. 
there was no need for no no need to look for a way to pass the time because you were engaged in a pleasant conversation and enjoying food. So how does boredom factor into this? In this example, boredom doesn't come from something external, but it comes from your own existence. Your decision to go to this party stems from a desire to do something interesting and meaningful with your evening. The party itself, albeit very pleasant, was also incredibly predictable and in that sense, unable to fulfill its promise. But the problem is not the party, it's you. Your decision to visit this party was inspired by the fact that you are bored with your own existence. You were looking for color and excitement in your monotonous existence. You did not look for a way to pass the time during the party because the party itself was one big attempt to pass the time. An attempt to escape this uneasy feeling creeping up of you, on you, this feeling of boredom. Heidegger calls this form of boredom being bored with something. In the third, most profound form of boredom, passing the time is no longer an option. Where in the first two forms you were able to shake off this uneasy feeling, this time the feeling is all encompassing and inescapable. In this most profound form of boredom, everything loses its meaning to you. None of your hobbies, interests, projects or friends matter to you anymore. The whole world withdraws from you into utter meaninglessness and you're left staring at the void that used to be your meaningful existence. Heidegger calls this form of, form of boredom, it is boring for one. Choosing these words to do justice to the deep feelings of emptiness and depersonalization that accompany it. And yet, hope glimmers in this void, at least if you are a philosopher. Because precisely when the world withdraws into utter meaninglessness, it reveals the way in which it used to be meaningful to you. Usually these meanings are implicit. You do not need to reflect on the meaningful structures that surround you because you, because you simply do not need to in everyday life. Consider the laptop you are watching this on right now. As long as it functions, you do not need to be concerned with how or why it functions. It is only when it doesn't function anymore, when it breaks, that the why and how of its functioning becomes relevant. Existential boredom constitutes a similar kind of breakdown, given a, a space to reflect on the why and how of the meaningful relations that surround us. So in conclusion, no more dinner parties, let the boredom flow through you. Uh, Tim, um, just um, uh, you talked about uh, three kinds of uh, boredom uh, what kind of boredom uh, do you think was depicted in this um, this movie well i think you saw um different kinds of boredom going on there i think one one thing that is very recognizable uh when it comes to the movie uh compared to what i said earlier is the fact that people are going to look for ways to pass the time when they are bored, right? You see the um, the person playing poker, which is could be seen as akin to someone uh, enjoying a dinner party. Um, the kids are playing football, could be seen as the same thing. It seems a very dreary summer day and everybody's just looking for a way to pass the time. Uh, one one interesting thing that I think you see in the movie, um, and that makes me think of um, another philosopher who does a lot with uh, Martin Heidegger, a Dutch philosopher called Abe Prins. Um, he also he wrote his dissertation on boredom, and he, akin to what Heidegger says, writes that we should we are always trying to flee from boredom, always running away from boredom, always trying to look for ways to pass the time. Um, and instead he suggests that we let boredom into our lives, that we stop running from it and we just accept boredom. Um, and by doing that, uh, he suggests that we would develop an eye for the unexpected everyday um, things that are going on, on around us, a sharper eye for what's actually in our close proximity for what's actually going on in our everyday lives and I think I, I see that depicted in the movie in the in the sense that if, if these people were um, 
the people in the movie, if they were really busy um, being in a talk, being in a, in a uh, dealing with work or something like that, they would probably just close the window as soon as that uh, that man on the street started screaming. And instead, mm-hmm. um, they were all sitting around being bored, somehow letting the boredom in. And the fact that they were bored and that they, um, in that moment, let themselves be bored, opened them up to, uh, well, an unexpected, something unexpected that happened there on all these balconies. So, so that, that brings me to my, my second question, because uh, from what I understand, Heidegger's approach is very uh, individualistic. So uh, he talks about uh, feeling bored yourself and you may turn to others to pass the time. But these people in the movie uh, seem to share their boredom. Is, is that something that, that is um, conceivable within this framework you have given us? Yes, most certainly. I, I think um, well, the way Heidegger talks about so boredom is a is a mood, and uh, Heidegger talks a lot about different kinds of moods, moods uh, mostly about boredom and anxiety. Um, and the way he talks about them, the way he talks about these moods, it, is always in a, an intersubjective way. So always something that's not. Uh, on me alone, but uh, that happens in me alone, but always something that happens um, as a share, as something that is shared uh, between people. So he gives the example of um, so a different mood, something like sadness. So when you uh, when you walk a, a room and you're very happy and very high energy, uh, but you you enter a room and you see the people in that room. Um, are very sad and are in a very serious and sad conversation. Someone has happened, something has happened to one of the participants in the conversation, something like that. Then even before you understand the words that they're saying, the mood is immediately apparent to you. The mood in the room is something that you immediately feel and that influences your own mood. And that will stop you if, if you enter very happy and high energy, you will immediately feel the different mood in the room and adjust your own behavior. Your own mood will adjust almost sort of immediately without you needing to reflect on it. So that the, the, the idea that boredom can also become a shared uh, mood, something intersubjective shared between people, uh, that live in the same building, that are enjoying the same hot summer day in which nothing is really happening. And that is very much in line with what Heidegger uh, would say about that, I think. And um, uh, are there, so you talked about boredom being a ground for uh, um, philosophy. Uh, is, is that the the, the only way to come to philosophy or are there other such moods according to uh, Heidegger or according to you? No, well, Heidegger explicitly mentions two um, in his work, as I uh, as I already said. Uh, anxiety is, is, is one other one. He says that in, in, in sort of anxiety, there are, of course, like in, in boredom, there are different kinds of stages, right? You have the more everyday type of just being afraid of something, being afraid of a spider or something like that. But then you have the the very deep existential type of anxiety in which something similar happens to, uh, to what Heidegger describes in boredom. Right, so what happens there as well is be, you are just afraid of your own existence, and everything, sort of, the meaning of everything falls away, uh, and you are left there on your own with only your own existence, um, confronted with, therefore, confronted with the the meaninglessness and finitude of your own existence. So he he mentions these specific two, but in the fundamental concept of metaphysics, he um, he also, before settling on boredom as the mood that he's 
going to address there. He specifically mentions that it's not necessarily the only mood that could be a starting point for philosophy. But he is looking for something that could be a starting point for us right now to start philosophizing. And he says this boredom is a very deep, shared cultural feeling mm-hmm. um, that is somehow prevalent in everybody. And this is Prince makes the same observation. He says it's this kind of unheimlich, uh, eerie feeling of is this all there is? Um, is this really all there is to life that is somehow uh, present in our contemporary society, very much present in our contemporary society? So that's why, according to Heidegger, boredom is, is most definitely um, so not the only uh, not the only mood that we have, but he says it is a very, it is the, the if for us, uh, people that are very much uh, attuned by this mood of boredom, it is the right one to uh, to start philosophizing. And I would because tend be, to uh, agree with that. Be, uh, my follow-up question then would be, um, can you force boredom? Like you, you are a philosopher. <laughs> you want to. You're starting your day. Is is it something that overcomes you, or is it also something that you can train yourself in, or or become better at? Well, I don't. I don't think you can force it. You don't. Uh, well, I now that I'm saying it, just sit around on the couch and saying, now <laughs> I'm going to going to get bored. If you don't do anything else, that will. Yeah. Oh, almost immediately happen. No, I think it is something that you can, in a, in a certain sense, train yourself yeah. in, in the sense that you um, mm-hmm. you have to, like I said before uh, with Prince as well, you have to learn to let it in. You know, we have the very strong tendency. Yeah. I have the very strong tendency to, especially now with smartphones at hand any time of the day, to use any moment that I have to wait for something, anything, any sort of even if it's five seconds waiting waiting before traffic light, I tend to get my smartphone out of my pockets to quickly check my email and do something. Yeah. Um, what you have to do yeah. is oh, to cool. stop doing that and let the boredom in. All right. That is a great uh, note to um, uh, go to the uh, next speaker with. Thanks, uh, Tim. Tim will return uh, after the second um, film uh, for a discussion uh, with the uh, other speaker, who is Eva McInerney, uh, who will be uh, talking to us about loneliness. She is a PhD uh, candidate um, working on Hannah Arendt and phenomenology at Radboud uh, University and Limerick University, and is a recipient of the Iris Research Council Scholarship. Um, and after uh, Eva's lecture, we'll watch the uh, short movie Woman Without a Child by Eva Saez, um, which is about the loneliness of a single uh, woman that disappears when she rents out a room to a stranger. Uh, and once again, if you have any questions, you can go to menti.com and we'll address them after the lectures. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Tim, uh, for if you're bored at a dinner party, you're the problem. I tend to assume that anyway. But Hannah, um, I'm here to talk to you about Hannah Arendt's conception of loneliness, which has particular relevance today, not only because of the pandemic and increased isolation, but because for her, the phenomenon of mass loneliness has political consequence. For this reason, then, loneliness is not primarily taken in the existential sense as an opportunity for self-authenticity. Rather, loneliness is a state of deprivation. In fact, what is at stake when we are lonely is a sense of reality itself. The first point, then, is that loneliness stands in complete opposition to what Arendt calls the human condition of plurality. That is, and I quote, to the fact that men, not man, live on the earth and inhabit the world, end quote. It is the basic recognition of the ontological diversity of the human condition. That is to say that there is no the human being, but human beings. This will perhaps at first seem so obvious as to be boring, 
However, the assertion of human plurality actually accuses and challenges not only traditional philosophy's prioritization of man in the singular, but also the tendency of modern behavioral science to reduce the spontaneity and diversity of human action to behavior, which is predictable and hence knowable. Instead, human plurality contains the uniqueness and equality of each and every person. Yet this uniqueness and equality are not autonomous traits. That is to say, they do not manifest in isolation from others. Understandably, what is unique about you becomes most apparent in the company of others in the world. I say in the world because one's individuality is not fully achievable on one's own, be it via introspection or some meditative methodology. Because of this, plurality is the crucial but the paradoxical condition of uniqueness and togetherness, of equality and distinction. To this end, personal identity is achieved intersubjectively in human action, which is spontaneous and revelatory. But there is another, perhaps even more important outcome of plurality and human interaction. This is reality itself. Meaningful reality is achieved in public, not in private. This should not be taken as a form of idealism. Arendt certainly does not believe that human beings make reality or create reality. Her point is that in interaction with others, our experience attain a richness and a depth that we cannot achieve alone. Reality is by definition public. It stands in opposition, uh, not in opposition, but in relation to our private lives. This privacy conceived primarily in terms of the home or the oikos in Greek. To appear in public gives us not only our personal identity, but a shared reality. To quote Arendt, for us appearance, something that is seen and heard by others as well as by ourselves constitutes reality. Compared with the reality which comes from being seen and heard, even the greatest forces of intimate life the passions of the heart, the thoughts of the mind, the delights of the senses lead an uncertain, shadowy kind of existence, end quote. This shadowy existence can refer to both intimate life of the private space of the home as well as the social realm. But for our purposes this evening, I want to focus on these private spaces and the activities appropriate to them. The distinction between public and private space comes down to a distinction between freedom and necessity. In private, you take care of life's necessities, traditionally conceived, such as feeding, eating, sleeping, but almost any activity concerning the body. These needs are traditionally associated with the activity of labor. Again, I quote Arendt, labor cor corresponds to the biological process of the human body, end quote. For this reason, historically, slaves and women were barred from a public life. Again, I quote Arendt, hidden away were the laborers and the women who with, their, who with their bodies guaranteed the physical survival of the species, end quote. The shadow existence of these people lacked the reality and the capacity to actualize their humanness. Again, as Arendt writes, the, privacy, the, the privation of privacy lies in the absence of others. As far as they are concerned, private man does not appear. Therefore, it is as though he did not exist. Whatever he does remains without significance and consequence to others. And what matters to him is without interest to other people, end quote. But this does not necessarily mean that we are dealing with loneliness. Even in the shadowy space, I am capable of keeping myself company. This is the condition of thinking and not cognizing. True loneliness occurs when I am unable to keep myself company. I am abandoned by others and myself. Under these circumstances, I lack a sense of place in the world which, in which I need others to guarantee. In other words, I become alienated. And I want to quote Arendt again. What makes loneliness so unbearable is a loss of oneself, which can be realized in solitude, but confirmed in its identity only by uh, trusting and trustworthy company of my equals. In this situation, man loses trust in himself as a partner of his thoughts that are the elementary confidence in the world which is necessary to make experiences at all. Self and world, capacity for thought and experience are lost at the same time." End quote. Loneliness annihilates the condition of plurality for Arendt. Experiences of mass loneliness and homelessness are no longer marginal experiences, but occurring ever more frequently and often right under our noses. Mm. Eva, you talked about uh, boredom and the difference uh, between public and private uh, life. I think what we uh, 
uh, just saw was mainly or loneliness uh, getting this all these uh, intense feelings mixed up already um, it was because you were bored during my talk so it's fine <laughs> That not my words, yours. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, I think what we saw mainly had to do with, with you know, getting out of a situation of um, uh, loneliness. Uh, maybe how does this relate to the, um, the distinction you uh, just uh, described? Yeah. Um, so the distinction that Aaron makes between public and private, which is actually. Um, a, an ancient Greek distinction um, was what really came to my mind when I was watching the movie. Um, because as I discussed with Aaron, um, public life gives you uh, an actualization of your own identity. And I believe in the, in the film, this, this woman was precisely lacking not only that publicity, but her, her recognition as, as a woman, as an individual, um, and also that, that sexual side of her life. So when, when she takes this, uh, this renter in, he fulfills a lot of roles for her, a lot of needs. She's both caretaker for him, and in that sense, I guess, maternal. Um, but she's also voyeuristically and vicariously living through him as well as the neighbors that she's watching out, out her window. Um, so for me, this all takes place in the home. And I believe that she's lacking that publicity. And because of that, um, yeah, a fuller identity, if I can say that. So, so I understand why that is, um, uh, that we need some sort of recognition from other people in order to have a full identity, that there are certain aspects of our life uh, for example, uh, the, 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 to care and to be cared for that, that necessarily have to do with intersubjectivity, with two uh, subjects, two people. However, I, uh, in what sense is that um, public in the more political sense of the, of the term? Why is what public in the political sense? The, Sorry. the, the fact that we uh, need um, uh, relations uh, with other people for our identity to come to fruition? Well, the the political for Arendt um, is primarily public in that in that way, um, but it also occurs in a public space. So it occurs outside the home in a shared shared world, a shared space. And I think at the end of the movie, when when that boy, when he posts that picture of them online, I, I saw that as her first step out into a public space outside of the home. Also, um, for me, the striking thing was when she's when she's at work and she's cleaning and the woman passes on the stairs and she says, how's your mother? And she said, my mother's been dead six months. I mean, yeah. That's that's not a fulfilling interaction. That's that's the invisibility that we associate with the oikos, with the home, and with the mes uh, domesticity of the activity um, that occurs in private. Uh, so you you I I understand uh, what you mean in the example of him posting on social media. I think is very interesting. So would you say that that social media is the uh, private sphere entering the public sphere, or is it the public sphere entering the uh, private sphere? Well, now you've opened up a whole can of worms because social media is the social, and that's a that's another mm -hmm. distinction for Arendt, which is precisely the blurring of the two realms. And for her, it's a very negative thing. But in the context of women without a child, I think it's... Um, more positive than Arendt would would actually allow it to be. So you uh, you you have this sort of idea that um, uh, exposure to other people who maybe have more fulfilling social lives may, can make you feel more lonely. To be to be lonely in a crowd is of course a very famous uh, phrase. Uh, so so how would if if uh, the, the public sphere is the answer to um, loneliness, which, if I understand you and Aaron correctly, is primarily a private phenomenon. Um, how does this work, this, this more individualistic feeling of loneliness 
within uh, a crowd? Well, I mean, for Aaron's, the interesting term is mass loneliness, things that we don't normally associate together, like lots of people and and loneliness. Um, but for her, uh, I suppose the, the political relevance of that sense of loneliness is the erosion of our reality. And when that happens, we become politically more susceptible to, to ideology. Um, so that's that is the context of loneliness and politics for, for Arendt. So what do you mean by ideology, ideology in this sense? Ideology so strange is... strange political ideas or, or any political ideas or... Any, anybody, any theory that tells you that it can explain the complexity of the world with one idea, with one logic, via one process, whether it's the teleological unfolding of history, whether it's evolution and survival of the fittest is lying to you. Reality is just more complicated and it's complicated because it's constituted by other people. And when you are beholden to an ideology, this too eliminates plurality. And when you're lonely, well, plurality is already eliminated. So you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable to certain, certain things. Mm, yeah, but what kind of things? Can you give an example? Yeah, I mean, okay, I don't, uh, well, like extremism, um, um, but, but even just um, the tendency to, to marginalize and to de-individualize people, to make groups of people anonymous, this is, you know, this are, these are the political effects of, of what we're talking about. I mean, and that happens, so that's quite quotidian, you know, that's, that's, they're extreme, but they happen all the time. So if I understand you correctly, you, 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 you mean sort of in being lonely, you get cut off from public life and uh, that um, uh, brings forth the fact that people tend to uh, become more susceptible to uh, simplistic worldviews. Yes, and that's you're not understanding me, but I aren't there. But you, you, you know, you are here as a spokesperson uh, <laughs> for her. So uh, anyway, uh, I think that is a nice uh, cue to bring back uh, our other uh, speaker, speaker Tim uh, Michels, because if uh, I understand this, loneliness uh, makes you susceptible uh, to more simplistic ideas, while boredom makes you susceptible to more intricate ideas are can they be considered the opposites of one another when it comes to their sort of philosophical nature tim um well that's um um that's a very interesting question i would say that possibly as if Boredom and loneliness explained in the way that we have explained it now here do seem kind of opposite uh, opposite attitudes. I don't know if you agree, mm -hmm. Eva, but it, it would seem to me that the, the type of boredom that I'm talking about would indeed open, open you up to different possibilities, uh, would allow for more open attitude in, instead of a more sort of closed off uh, attitude, which which um, I don't know, does indeed seem to be very uh, at the very different end from the, the the kind of loneliness. I mean, the problem is that I'm mm -hmm. not convinced by Heidegger's account of loneliness being a productive capacity for philosophy, and perhaps I'm too Arendtian. Oh, sorry, boredom. Now I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Boredom having a productive capacity for being, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the beginning of philosophy, because, mm -hmm. well, for me, I'm more convinced by uh, Thaumasein, so by wonder. And, the, yeah, it really comes down to a form of worldly engagement. When I think of boredom, mm -hmm. I'm not engaged in the world. And you have to be for philosophy, I think. Well, I mean, that's... Um... I think that for 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 Heidegger, so he is very much a philosopher that is also thinking about 
precisely our engagements with the world. But for Heidegger, there has to be a moment that makes these engagements visible. Because normally during our everyday lives, we are almost absorbed in our activities. Um, so what reason do you have? What sort of Kickstarter do you have to start reflection? Uh, that's the question that he's coming from. And for Heidegger, that, that moment is always a moment where something breaks down, where the normal way of our normal way of engaging, our normal way of interacting with the world, our normal everyday lives in which we are always absorbed and live our lives, in which it all of a sudden breaks down and something happens that makes you wonder. Something happens that shakes things up. Um, and that uh, calls but you've for used reflection. a key word there, Tim. You've said it yourself. It's wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but boredom is the cause of that wonder. You you need boredom first. You need you first need a break. And I think that's also why why I, why Heidegger is always talking about these these sort of negative emotions like uh, anxiety and boredom, precisely because I... we need we need a break, um, a hard break from from um, <laughs> our active and engagement and such a heavy negative mood or emotion is precisely what constitutes uh, such a break. Then I'm doing boredom wrong because when I'm bored, I am just numb. I'm numb to the world. I'm numb to ideas, but either I'm doing it really well or I'm doing it completely <laughs> wrong. But. I think you have to, you have to go deeper into the rabbit hole of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, could you give a account of boredom then from Aaron's perspective uh, in the sense of this public-private distinction? What, what, what role can uh, mass boredom play? Uh, I mean, she doesn't address this uh, specifically, but I mean, she's not here, so I could give it a go what I think she would say. But again, it comes back to, uh, for Aaron, the world um, is always her main concern. So she has a kind of allergy to any introspective, any alienating um, or even existential quest for authenticity that I can carry out by myself in contemplation. Um, for her, yeah, I think what, what breaks down in boredom is, is an engagement with the world where, where I have a relationship with, with the world. And that, that breakdown is, I don't, I don't think it's a productive one, but it could just be me because I'm, I'm not convinced by boredom. Um, All right, but then I would like to ask the same that or the opposite question to to Tim. Uh, how would you think about loneliness uh, from this idea that you yourself said that all moods are in a way shared, because shared loneliness seems <clears throat> to be an oxymoron. Well, and, and, and that's why I think um, I'm actually glad you asked this because I, I wished I said it during our previous little conversation. Um, <laughs> so the, the idea of the, those moods is that they're always intersubjective. But um, And I think boredom can also very much be intersubjective. I, I don't know if you know this experience, but when, when you're sitting in a, in a classroom in a, in a lecture hall and like half of the group is very... Uh, very actively bored by the lecture. Yeah. It's very hard to stay interested in the face of people next to you being extremely bored. So I think the more superficial uh, types of boredom can easily be shared and intersubjective. I don't see a problem there. But in the most sort of the most profound existential boredom, that really throws you back upon yourself. That is a very sort of very lonely uh, moment indeed. That is where all your relations also break down, right? Also the, your, your meaningful relations to your friends, to the people around you, these also break down. They, these relations, it's not like, oh, I, I'm bored. I'll just call a friend and now I'm out of it. No, your friends lose their meaning to you as well. Everything loses its meaning. It's just you and the void. So, um, but what what happens in that moment yeah. is because your their, your your friendships lose their normal significance and relevance. All of a sudden, yeah. questions can open up 
regarding the nature of, of friendship and what your friends really do mean to you and why you think friendship is important and the different relations that you have in your life. So this moment of breakdown is, is in that sense, it throws you back upon yourself, but um, it puts you in a position where you can actually see all the, for the first time, the, the different kinds of meaningful relations that you have draw attention to themselves and you can actually see and contemplate and ask questions. All right, all right. So so the philosopher uh, exists in isolation. Uh, it seems very lonely. There's a third um, emotion that relates to the uh, uh, next movie we're going to see. It's impatience. Um, what is the role of impatience? Because that seems to to be, uh, you know, you can be impatient about a lot of things, but usually you are impatient about other uh, people uh, and because they should hurry up. How does this relate to this 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 feeling of, of isolation? I think that you both addressed. Um, Eva, would you like to uh, start? Yeah, I mean, when I think of impatience, loneliness and boredom, I think the one thing that does connect him, um, sorry, Simon, I'm not going to directly respond to your question, um, is actually our experiences of time under these phenomena. So, and I think it's most apparent with impatience, right? Um, time just seems to stretch agonizingly out before you, especially when you're caught walking behind a slow walker and you feel that irrational rage. But it's, yeah, for me, it's the experiences of, of time um, that, 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 that seems to kind of elongate um, under impatience, but also boredom and loneliness. Um, yeah, and also in isolation, when you're, when you're, when you're lonely and, and you, you want to get out of that state and you were, you're kind of projecting yourself forward, you're not experiencing time as it is now, you're not experiencing things as they are now, instead you want relief from from the unbearable loneliness, as Arendt would say. All right. Tim, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I think, um, I think I would, uh, speaking for Heidegger, <laughs> <laughs> in this sense, very much, uh, um, very much agree. Yeah? So the the whole idea of 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 being caught. So Heidegger also says that this whole visiting a di dinner party is an explicitly not dealing uh, with your uh, past or future and even your present. It's really uh, not dealing with your temporality at all in that moment. And so you see that impatience and in. In regards to boredom, you see that impatience very much um, in the ways, in the whole mechanism of um, trying to pass the time, trying to make the, the time speed up by seeking distractions or something like that. So the Heidegger associates the 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 idea of impatience. I think he would associate that with the 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 idea of curiosity. So I, as I started, curiosity for Heidegger is not a good start for for philosophy because in, in curiosity what you what do you want you you're constantly looking for something new to distract yourself currently constantly looking for the newest show on netflix the newest gadget to buy the the newest thing the, it's a very curiosity according to heidegger is a very superficial ad, attitude in which you constantly jump from one thing to the next and never really um uh, let something engage. You're never engaged by something, really. As, as soon as and, and something like that threatens to happen, you move on to the next thing, which is a very, I think, impatient attitude as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn to some questions uh, by the audience. I think the first question is one that relates to um, uh, both uh, uh, speakers, um, uh, and that is the question, can boredom be politically subversive? Uh, so just like loneliness can have its uh, political impact by making people susceptible to certain ideas, can boredom also have this uh, function? 
Well, I, I, I would say maybe to not, I would say not boredom itself in the sort of existential Heideggerian sense that I'm using it, but possibly the sort of the, the, the counter side of boredom, the constantly looking for distractions, looking for the something new, something exciting. Uh, I think that could be so. Basically, the whole, at least, American politics is 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 turning into reality TV, uh, which could be seen as a could also be construed as a sort of looking for distractions, looking for something something weird, something new, just to not deal with the not deal with our uh, deep and existential boredom. Right, Eva, would you like to add something uh, to that? Um, in terms of the yeah politically deleterious effects of, of loneliness, I think we've yeah I think we've covered that. Um, yeah, it makes you more susceptible to to ideologies. Boredom. Oh, boredom. Apologies. Does boredom <laughs> play a also can um, boredom also play a role in that, according to you I mean, or Aaron? Yeah. Or, well, I, I would agree with Tim then in that in our efforts to relieve boredom, we often try to like fill it with, with things and with, uh, with distractions. Um, and in that sense, then we kind of have this, um, yeah, perverted engagement with, with the world, an insincere one, a one that's fulfilling some sort of other end without really engaging, engaging and engaging critically with with events. So, um, are these uh, emotions we talked about, boredom and loneliness, always uh, by definition unpleasant? That's another question from uh, the audience. It's a, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, shall I start? Um, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel like there are the, the existential boredom, um, as Heidegger describes it, seems to me to be a very unpleasant state to be in. I think the <laughs> the unpleasantness is is really an important part to it. It's really what constitutes mm -hmm. the breakdown to have your life see your existence see devoid of meaning. I I don't see how, how that could be construed as a somehow poly I mean it could have sort of the in of course philosophizing and reconsidering your relationships and the meaning the things that you consider meaningful and all that it can have a, a positive outcome um, but I don't see how that form of uh, boredom could be in itself a positive experience when we look at when you look at the more sort of the the more everyday type of boredom that that Ave Prince is talking about, a sort of the more everyday boredom where you are indeed sitting in the station or sitting in the train, um, sitting in a train that is very much delayed and you have nothing to do and your phone is dead and everything like that, and then instead of seeking the distraction, just letting the boredom in, letting your surroundings in take a look around you that kind of type of everyday boredom i think that that does not necessarily sound unpleasant to me all right yeah i mean with regards to loneliness um yeah as aaron said loneliness is, is unbearable because it's so contrary to the human condition of plurality but she does make a distinction between uh, loneliness and solitude where solitude is the, the pleasant form, where I am keeping myself company. And under those conditions, um, it's the perfect fertile environment for philosophical thought, for truth thinking. Um, and that is a pleasant experience. But actually, uh, another Orientian scholar, Dr. Samantha Rose Hill, uh, she says that loneliness, because it's unpleasant, is an opportunity and does have a pro, uh, productive capacity um, Whereas, uh, yeah, I think at least as Aaron describes it, it's it's entirely negative. Um. That's uh, an answer. These emotions, as they sound, are entirely 
negative, at least in their most profound for form, if I understand you both correctly. Thanks, Eva and Tim, for your uh, nice lectures and uh, discussion. And that brings us uh, to the end uh, of uh, today's program. The next uh, live stream is Thursday at eight o'clock with a lecture by Renata Salek about um, uh, ignorance. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, up until the 25th of April, there are other live streams accessible uh, at goshort.nl. Uh, Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you soon at another live stream of Go Short or Radboud Reflects. Thank you.